Dr. Franz Melter, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much and thanks everyone for your time and attention this uh, morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, with me today is Tom Lowry, National Director for Artificial Intelligence in Health and Life Sciences with Microsoft. I'm very pleased uh, to partner with you, Tom, on this webinar today. Hey, John, thanks for having me. It's great to see you. And uh, and this is going to be a very interesting topic. I'm I'm going to pitch some questions to you, Tom along the way. So be ready. Have your uh, have your baseball glove handy. Um, with a little bit of background here first, the the hospital at home concept, and that's the version of the of virtual care that we're going to be digging into a little bit. So virtual care is a broader topic. We're going to zero in on a pretty big component of that hospital at home, but it's newer in terms of the concept. So it's not new though entirely. The technology is more mature than it was initially. And if you look back, the original concepts were around 1995, Johns Hopkins uh, began doing some clinical trials and work and they published a study in 1999 showing some benefits, uh, but it didn't take off. It's been very narrow. They've, they've been a leader in the field, however, and uh, they've, they've uh, offered their processes and, and some technology offerings uh, to, to selected uh, providers around the country. In um, the process, a little bit past the time frame on the slide here, even in 2010, there's some public-private partnership testing that was done to modify the model for hospital at home, uh, home-based care provided by nurses with uh, physicians by consult, um, some telemedicine and video, uh, chats started to come into play after 2010. Uh, in 2014, Mount Sinai uh, Medical Center was awarded an Innovation Challenge grant from CMMI. So this has been evolving slowly uh, and, and t until suddenly in the last year and a half, two years uh, due to the pandemic, we know that it started to accelerate. So Tom, a question for you. Uh, compared to 20 years ago, the vision was there, but there were barriers technologically, uh, maybe that we don't even realize are not there today, but those barriers that were there 20 years ago, what, what would be an example of a couple of those technological barriers that are no longer there, They're, they've been removed? Well, it's funny to look at, at your slide, and, and for some of us, uh, the late 90s doesn't seem like that long ago, but, um, you know, to your question, in 95, 96, when Johns Hopkins was pioneering uh, some of the concepts we're talking about today, only about 15% of the American population even knew what the internet and World Wide Web were and were online in some form or fashion. So 20 years ago, some of us were experimenting with uh, use of the World Wide Web and the internet to do some basic collaboration with uh, patients and consumers. But, you know, to answer your question, I think there are three major differences. One, the advent of the cloud. When you look at the pervasive nature of cloud services today, it's secure, it's compliant. Uh, Microsoft has uh, uh, things like Microsoft Cloud for Health. It basically uh, took us from kind of paving over cow paths digitally to creating an Autobahn and immediately making that available. So we, we've got this great thing that allows us to do things differently. Second is the evolution of artificial intelligence. So 20 years ago, we were able to make predictions, we were able to do certain things uh, with it, but most of that uh, that could be done was either done in the lab, was not something that would be very repeatable in the real world environments. Fast forward to today, uh, we've got so many things that are human parity, uh, not only are they that, but they're industrial strength, industrial grade that can be componentized and used to drive change at scale. And the third thing has nothing to do with technology and it has a lot to do with when you think about consumer Health consumer sentiment today, uh, many of the ways in which we've provided healthcare by having people go to facilities uh, 20 years ago was not acceptable to some. Today, uh, there are many groups that simply would find those sort of things uh, being tethered to physical locations to be uh, very constraining. It's not what consumers want today. Excellent, thank you, Tom. And uh, there's a lot happening now. These are some uh, headlines. We've ripped it from news in the last, uh, in the last, uh, some of this in the last few weeks, but then some goes back further to uh, back as far as 2015, a vision for hospital at home programs. So what's the definition that we have for hospital at home? Hospital at home, it enables some patients who need acute level care 
to receive that care in their homes rather than in the hospital. So at its definition and a basic, uh, basic understanding, it is hospital level care that is, is traditionally given in the hospital, now being rendered when appropriate at home. This care delivery model has been shown to reduce costs, it improve outcomes, it improves outcomes, it enhances the patient experience. So it hits on the triple aim. It's really been pushed forward uh, and, and up to the surface due to the pandemic. It's spread in, uh, at this point into approximately 30 states of the US. So it's not diffused through all 50 states or into every organization, but it is spreading now. Um, one clarification is it doesn't mean less care. And so there are some misperceptions, you could say. There are also some uh, cultural reservations or hesitations that will have to be worked through. But there's a lot happening in this space now. To highlight some of the benefits that, has been, that have been demonstrated through studies that have been published. And this data is, is preliminary, I would say, because there's a limited number of studies out there. But they do show some of the following, as high as a 20% reduction in six-month mortality, up to a two-thirds reduction, a two-thirds reduction in 30-day readmissions. So only a third of the patients in, in these cohorts that would normally have been admitted end up getting readmitted to the hospital. Looking at total costs for hospitalization and, and presumably a tail on those costs to a third, up to a 38% reduction in cost for admission. So some of these are meta-analysis studies, a Cochrane analysis that was done, others are single studies. Tried to aggregate it here to show the potential and not every, not every implementation is done equally well, but the potential is dramatic if these, if these benefits are realized. And those benefits will be realized based upon selecting the right patients, the quality of the implementation, et cetera. Clearly, there's an association with hospital at home of resulting in fewer complications such as pressure injury, such as hospital acquired infections. You're not likely to get a MRSA if you never are in the hospital for your acute care episode. So it's very, very interesting, some of the, the, the change and shift in risk by just keeping the patient out of the hospital. In fact, just uh, um, digressing to uh, my, my residency in academic medicine days, we used to uh, uh, kind of a, gallows humor joke that the, the hospital is actually a very dangerous place for patients. And uh, there's some truth to that, as we know from the uh, crossing the chasm of healthcare and the, the Institute of Medicine and some of the uh, some of the alarms that they raised about 20 years ago around the, the health and safety concerns for hospital medicine. So this is a shift that we're seeing. And got a question, Tom, why uh, your thoughts on why is this so important from a health industry standpoint? Why is this, from the macro level, why is this really uh, a significant in healthcare at, at, from an industry perspective? Yeah, well, I, I think the great news is it's, it's part of this emerging uh, view and thinking uh, around looking at how we basically provide care anywhere. And it's driven by a lot of things, but I mean, the, the data you have on your slide uh, is a great way of starting with, you know, here are the measurable returns we're seeing when it comes to better quality, uh, reduced costs, and, and you know, your, your bottom uh, bullet point, uh, higher patient satisfaction. Uh, I, I know from some of my readings that initially when consumers hear about, you know, staying at home instead of going to the hospital, there's that question. But once they kind of understand the benefits, uh, the, the, the quality differences are, are if, if not negligible, maybe even better to stay in the home, uh, there's growing uh, sentiment on the consumer part to say, you know, given the choice of staying home or, you know, uh, putting you between the sheets in a hospital, uh, most consumers are going to want to stay home. Uh, beyond that, when you look at those long-term implications, as you're asking, um, I, I, I had the opportunity a um, month or so ago to spend time with what I think is one of uh, America's foremost gerontologists, Ken Dykewald, who writes a lot about uh, the coming challenges with uh, the growing number of older Americans. So uh, those who are in their 60s are probably digitally literate and pretty good, but when you look at boomers who are going to be hitting 75 plus, 85 plus, and, and the way we manage that health care service today, 
uh, just what he calls the pig through the python as these older people need increasingly more services the way we provide it today the system will implode unless we start looking at doing things differently so things like uh, you know hospital at home and all the other virtual events that people are pioneering to me that's the avenue for the future where eventually we're still going to need those hospitals but the ability to offload a lot of what we're doing to other locations and actually improve care and, and help meet the needs of consumers. I mean, who doesn't want that? That's right. Yes, yeah, sustainability is certainly a guiding principle that's pressuring some of this to accelerate, as well as uh, a small disruption that we had over a year ago now called a, a pandemic. So now a question for the audience. The hospital at home reflects another value-based care opportunity and this is one of uh, many that have emerged in the last five to almost 10 years now how likely do you think that value-based care initiatives especially this this one but value-based care initiatives in general will continue to eat away at hospital value uh, volumes so go ahead and enter your poll questions here and um and Tom, as, you, as you raise that question, it, I mean, as the free provocateur today, it's a great question, but, um, you know, would it be bad if all of a sudden we're reducing hospital volumes and, and people are getting at least as good a care in different care settings that actually delight them? And, and behind this question to me is probably that broader question that I, I know you're going to talk about, which is the regulatory reimbursement environment, because we can balance those things. Uh, whether volume goes up or down in the hospital, it, it to me really is about uh, quality care and improving that patient experience. Well, that's right, and we need to align incentives. We it's entertaining. We uh, and, and I'll just comment. Please vote your selection. We're going to be closing this poll in a moment. Um, but we originally worded the question a little differently: Is how concerned are you that this will eat away at hospital volumes and I was speculating we would end up with a with a biphasic or bimodal distribution. Everybody may agree that it's likely but half the people would be concerned and half the people wouldn't. So I, yeah. we, we reverted the question so that uh, our motivation for answering wouldn't be reflected in the answers. <laughs> Well, and again, this is where uh, I just, you know, I wish we had more time and the ability to chat with everyone, but uh, if we could reduce inpatient volumes, uh, but again, provide better care, improve, actually delight consumers, I mean, isn't that kind of what we're all trying to, to work towards? And this is where, you know, driven by technology, uh, which enables all of those caregivers and others to rethink uh, the clinical and operational workflows. I mean, to me, that's the that's the big goal that many of us are chasing. That's right. So anything about this surprise you, Tom? I'm not particularly surprised that 70% uh, are, are thinking is somewhat or very likely. Yeah, no, and, and again, to me, that's a positive of, uh, now how do we start taking uh, this and thinking through, uh, again, the workflow processes, uh, both in the hospital, uh, in the home, and then, the bridge to tie all of that together so there is this seamless continuum of service care um and, and uh yeah that's that's uh it's a great cause so if we look at so if somebody said not likely or they're neutral or even somewhat likely in my mind i might have said somewhat likely for this reason this is at least a four-legged stool if not more and if all of these things aren't balanced and in place then it could impede the diffusion of hospital at home and it could impede the transition to virtual care and hospitals could remain at or over capacity as as we uh, as we continue to in some places lose beds as well um, so in particular the legislative one i'm going to touch on that in a little more detail but if we don't have reimbursement in place for example then it's going to be harder to shift to a virtual care setting we're going to get into the legislative journey over the last year in a moment and culturally is another one where if there is there is uh, what I'm seeing in, in literature and anecdotally some initial resistance or concern. Uh, one of those misperceptions I mentioned earlier was, hey, I, I'm going to get less care or this is going to be lower or inferior quality or you're just trying to keep me out of the hospital so you don't have to spend as much money. So those concerns, uh, 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 cultural reflection um can be addressed by positive experiences and high quality care being rendered and again at this point one of the one of the um uh 
patient experience surveys I saw was 99% highly satisfied. Uh, hospitals would would uh, love to get those kind of scores for inpatient visits. And uh, so therein lies the reality is when people experience it done well, it's better. Now, yeah. so these four components, we're gonna dig a little deeper um, into technology and operational, of course. I'm gonna touch here on, uh, legis uh, on legislative in just a moment. But before I do, what's this really look like? So you've got a patient, and, and then we're gonna get into to some of the legs of the stool, but uh, you've got a patient that presents to the emergency department, we'll say Mrs. Lincoln, and uh, she's got pneumonia. And there are, there are certainly to start with some criteria that need to be met. Not every patient can be managed at home. So she meets criteria as, as defined and established and, uh, and then offered the option and she prefers to be treated at home. So she's transported home. And the next step is that there's a nursing assessment done, some patient onboarding because there has to be some digital, we'll call digital fluency capabilities to manage the technology that she'll be participating in. And then there's a physician assessment as well that can be in person. And then there are virtual touch points that follow until she's discharged, both with the provider and then also in-person visits um, by either paramedics or nursing. So in, depending upon the reimbursement, CMS right now just, just allows for a transfer from the ED or from inpatient setting. But if it's a private payer, they may, they may allow for uh, reimbursement when the patient's been referred from the office, for example, or a clinic. Uh, so there isn't necessarily, uh, outside of CMS, a rigid standard for uh, where they have to be transferred from. And uh, we've covered some of the other points here. Uh, what's, again, one of the biggest questions or barriers that, that has been removed as a result of the pandemic was uh, reimbursement. In March 2020, CMS instituted an exception, a waiver program called Hospitals Without Walls program. And this was to increase capacity, specifically due to COVID, and provide for flexibility to provide safe care at home. They did leverage at that time, the hospitals did leverage, obviously, technology like telemedicine, telehealth. And they were actually reimbursed, as I understand it, uh, in an equivalent, at an equivalent rate to if the patient had been in the hospital. This um, also allowed for transportation by an ambulance to certain non-traditional facilities, like a, a dormitory where patients were being housed or ambulatory surgery center or a hotel where they were being set up as a, as a spillover from the hospital. So, and again, that was an exception and a non-traditional uh, allowance for ambulances to transport a patient somewhere other than the hospital because we know that they aren't Uber transportation to go to the shopping mall, for example. The other interesting thing, like even lab testing could be done and travel to people's homes would, would be uh, covered for uh, doing COVID testing. And telehealth was reimbursed as well. So all of these things in telehealth, uh, we know that the more than tenfold increase in telehealth during 2020, all of these things were because of this first legislation, the Hospital Without Walls program. Now that was, with an expiration date. And so there was an expansion, an extension in November of 2020, the Acute Hospital at Home program. So it expanded hospitals without walls. And uh, initial, the initial participants were six hospital groups that got waivers, and that represented about 50 different hospitals. The patients had to meet criteria. Again, they could be transferred only from the hospital or the ED, and monitoring and, and, and uh, regular in-person visits had to be in place. And, uh, and so that is, a, that is a, a progression forward. And then you see here the tweet from January 4th is that an additional five hospitals uh, were added to make a total of 56. Now 56 isn't, a, isn't an especially large number when we're talking about over 5,000 hospitals in the US. So that's approximately 1% of the hospitals. So it's a great start but you can see that we have a little ways to go still. Yeah, John, if you're talking, I, I first of all, uh, just I wanna at least put out kudos to CMS. They uh, are moving faster than uh, normal. 
I, I think uh, if there's any good news about COVID, it uh, got everyone to start rethinking, and it was a forcing function to look at alternate ways of doing things. And, and I think uh, as a result of that, we've seen uh, a lot of movement, in, including CMS. It also proved that uh, when faced with the challenge, healthcare and healthcare leaders are capable of agile transformation. So as that's happened in the last year with the pandemic, uh, you know, now's the time to start looking at uh, all of the other options for alternative ways of, of how we've worked for the last few decades, including hospital at home. Thank you, Tom. So this is a, there's a lot on this slide. Uh, you can see the, the visual, the patient's in the center, and some of what's happening around this patient are operational processes. The patient's receiving um, biometric uh, monitoring, in other words, vital sign monitoring. That data is being sent over to a command center. The patient's um, uh, being seen by a nurse uh, by, and, and our paramedics, physicians, PAs, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, in-person, in-touch visits, as well as virtual. Um, there are other services, even uh, uh, radiology, x-ray, as well as pharmacy, uh, respiratory, and then, uh, of course, oxygen, IV fluids, antibiotics, et cetera. So all of this is wrapped around the patient. And then, and then the technology side. So the, the underpinnings for this, the less visible components of operations is the technology. You've got data being created, and if it's not being interpreted and providing intelligence to a command center that's now more virtual, then they might miss a signal that says, hey, this patient's at risk for deteriorating. The technology includes video conferencing, Wi-Fi uh, phones, uh, continuous access. The, you know, if, it, if the internet goes out uh, on this patient, it's a little different than if the patient is in the hospital. And uh, so the data flow becomes extremely important for the patient who's in a hospital at home receiving acute care. Wearables uh, are certainly a component today and they're likely to become more important as well as uh, uh, continuous monitoring technology. And this is really interesting. I see this as a, as a growing field, uh, touchless technology, um, and, and, uh, and where there's less of a burden. For example, the patient's at home and they, we need to check the blood pressure. How's that gonna get done? Or check the pulse and the, and the vital signs. How's that gonna get done if there's not a nurse right there? We gotta teach the patient to take their own vitals. So Tom, a question for you is what is autonomous, th this one is really intriguing to me, what does autonomous monitoring look like in the next few years so that uh, we don't have to have a nurse sitting there at the bedside, the patient doesn't have to be trained on taking their vitals, and that's, that's just the basic example, and this could extend, but what does that look like? We're, um, yeah. Where we may have some technology uh, available but not yet in use, what are your thoughts there? Well, I mean, I... Uh... There's autonomous, I'd probably shift that a little bit to talk about how we automate some of that monitoring, including processes that are human driven that, that can be automated to be less human driven. And, and second, I'd always back up to say, as we look at uh, you know more ways of, of doing things, including monitoring, which, which is just um, how we generate, collect and, and provide data uh, to put in the hands of those clinicians, doctors, nurses, others. So anything we're doing is, is to collect that data to help those caregivers do a better job at what they're best at, that things like AI will never be as good at. So, so in that regard, um, you know, we're seeing a lot, of, again, the, the cloud creates that auto bond for data. It allows us to, to take data, shift it around anywhere, pull from it anywhere, uh, many of the devices you're talking about uh, continually are becoming smart devices through AI being under the hood. So uh, all of that's going on. Uh, and now it's more a matter of, well, what are all the ways in which we automate things? So uh, an example that may seem a little far out, but MIT uh, just in the last month uh, reporting on some really interesting things with the use of fully digital fabrics. So we've had uh, sensing fabrics that are analog. They're now working with imagine fabrics. It could be a shirt. It could be a mattress pad. It could be many things that allows uh, the, the fabric is actually the sensor. Uh, not only does it sense, it can store and do computing 
with a fabric. So if we just take that, for example, and think about uh, a, some type of mattress that is fully sensing with just a fabric, um, those are the things where, as I look uh, down the road, we're going to find different ways to pretty much make, um, you know, sensing um, pervasive, seamless, and really in the background rather than having to somehow learn how to do it. So uh, we see that um, it's, it's going to be happening and it's a big focus on really the usability of sensors comes down to the technology then how we bring that together in a way where it really is viable to be having uh, continuous monitoring and it doesn't require a lot of technical training on the part of the consumer. Well, that's that's a, a it's getting me excited thinking about this. I it, you know the the concept of of uh, a, of a more effective fall prevention program uh, while a patient's at home by uh, silently monitoring and being aware of what's happening with the patient is pretty incredible. So our next poll question for the for the audience here, what do you see as the greatest barrier for all of this to become a reality? Hopefully you're getting a little bit excited too, but now it's a little bit of cautious optimism is warranted because uh, there are still some challenges. So which of these is the greatest in your mind, the technology investment? Um, by cognitive, over, cognitive overload, I'm referring to just the the burden of doing something different, and, uh, and 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 certainly that became headline news last year as as uh, clinicians were exhausted uh, with the vol sheer volume and also the newness of things that they had to do. Uh, cultural barrier again, uh, let her see here, or then reimbursement confusion or limitations, the policy. So go ahead and make your selection. We'll be closing the poll here in a moment and uh, getting feedback from the audience. So John, as you're, we're, we're waiting, I'll, I'll come back to uh, the earlier conversation and question. I mean, for me, things like the autonomous uh, monitoring, it really comes down to, we've got a lot of great technology. It's about how we do uh, design for usability. And, and some of that's directed at the consumer, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of literature that shows there's great technology for monitoring, but it's not designed in a way where that 70 plus uh, crowd would know what to do with it. But that same usability issue, I believe, applies to clinicians. We, we've seen time and time again where there's great technology that's been designed, but then you put it in the hands of a practicing physician or nurse, and they'll find five ways to say, well, this is great as technology, but it really doesn't fit the way we do care, the way I practice. So that design for usability goes for both the consumer and also the clinicians and the caregivers who, you know, they need help with those things as well. Excellent. Now, now we have the poll results. And um, interestingly, I'm, I am pleased to see that there's, there's optimism around the technology. And uh, unfortunately, I think we may all share some a little bit of skepticism around the clarity that we need from the legislative policy standpoint. If this isn't reimbursed, it's going to be a pretty significant barrier. And I think we recognize that. So. Any other observations from the poll responses here, Tom? Well, what I say is, to me, this is very positive in that, um, you know, lack of enthusiasm is uh, not as, you know, I, I think there are a lot of people who are very positive, uh, particularly those who are on the front line of delivering care. You know, they want to have new ways of doing things. They want to be innovative. And that only happens if the, the ecosystem aligns behind them, including things like reimbursement including things like uh, leadership of health organizations really looking at how to stretch themselves beyond their normal business models. And that's where um, in the hands of, of innovative clinicians, transformation takes place. And, and it really is, is backed by increasingly great technology, artificial intelligence in the cloud. That's right. I, I, considering all change has some skeptics and people who are holding back, I think that this is something uh, that makes sense that will be embraced, uh, certainly more than some of the reluctance we've seen uh, around uh, folks getting the COVID vaccination. You've got some holdouts there, but in this case, I don't think we're gonna have as many holdouts when they see how how, how much value it brings to them as patients. Uh, and it's promoted by most likely phys physicians, nurses, clinicians as well, the, the value uh, that it brings to them. So uh, that is, our poll question, I'm gonna come uh, into the next slide here. 
just highlighting again, qualitatively, uh, and we touched on this earlier, but think about the benefits from this standpoint. Some of these are from a patient-centric standpoint. Um, fewer complications uh, when a patient's, for example, when a patient's um, just admitted to the hospital for any reason, they have some baseline dementia, that in itself is enough to cause an exacerbation of, of symptoms of dementia. And uh, there, are, uh, there are significantly fewer uh, episodes of delirium or confusion when a patient is kept in their home environment. So that's an example. Greater satisfaction with care for both patients and family members. <clears throat> they won't have to travel to the hospital. They come into their, their loved one's home. Uh, as an example, there wouldn't necessarily be barriers or visiting hours. I mean, all these things are pluses. As well as better functional outcomes, this has been outlined in literature. It becomes a very patient-centric, patient-centered or person-centered approach. The plans of care have to be tailored to the individual because now they're in their home setting. This has some really good uh, uh, potential to it on the tail. I'm gonna come back to that. On the tail of the discharge and the patients released from the acute care setting, there are there, there are opportunities to do more there, and I'm going to and there's a great uh, question from the audience too. I'm going to come back to the opportunities around the tail of that discharge because the patient's at home, and then of course linking um, uh, proactively to um, disease management programs and hospice care. Now there are challenges, and we've mentioned some of these challenges already. Uh, you've got uh, and, and and I'm glad that there was not a lot of concern on the technology investment. But there are technology, there's a lot of work to do on the technology side. Infrastructure investment, there are multiple, multiple technologies that have to be in play. Data management technologies, uh, analytics and artificial intelligence, um, internet of things and smart, smart devices. And all these things have to be working in a coordinated way, as well as a, uh, somebody in the home having some digital fluency so they can manage themselves and you know push the button and open a video call, for example. Right. So these all these all add up on the challenge side that there's still work to do. Mm -hmm. um, from a technology challenge, I've got a question for you here. Do you see this as as the perfect opportunity for an ecosystem? type approach that Microsoft has and collaborative partners coming together? Or do you see a single vendor solving all of these challenges? Um, well, I think the simple answer is <laughs> technology is at the heart of enabling and, uh, and empowering uh, clinicians and others to, to change the way they practice and provide care. You know, beyond that, we've seen this with other uh, emergence of, of major trends in health and medicine, and that is, um, you know, it's rare that there's ever a single vendor, one that, that can do everything. And when you just look at the uh, multitude of things uh, that are technical, that are data driven as components of hospital at uh, home, there are just so many variables. It's, it's hard to imagine any one vendor, you know, could be top of the charts in providing all of that. I think that's where the benefit of things like, and obviously I'm a, a fan of the Microsoft model, but where you know Microsoft creates great underlying technology, great cloud solutions, and then it really is uh, you know something that that the best of a breed w with whatever one does in the health and medical ecosystem of you know vendors and other partners using that as building blocks to do something unique that's within you know, their own base of expertise, whether they're electronic medical record vendors, diagnostic imaging, or in the case of Javion, the great work you do in your, your business and data model of being able to look at multiple data points on an individual patient or population of patients and the juxtaposition of all those data in terms of helping clinicians better understand what's happening, whether it's in the hospital or in the home, to make better decisions. So I, I think it's that ecosystem I think there are a lot of great players out there. Uh, many are starting to focus on things like hospital at home and all the other things we've frankly learned and has been fast forwarded with, uh, with COVID in the last 18 months when it comes to care outside the walls of a clinic or a hospital. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a very fast learning season right now, isn't it? Yeah, and, and the only other thing I'd add on the challenges, and I just I have to do a shout out because it's important. You mentioned digital fluency, which is hugely important. And, there are times where uh, those of us who, you know, just don't even burn brain cells to do things online, 
we have to realize there are many uh, in the population that aren't in that same place. Again, think about that 75 plus and 85 plus, and not all of them are, uh, you know, some of them are digitally fluent, but many times the very people we serve, the most vulnerable populations, aren't always up to speed. Um, we always have to pay attention to the issue of health equity. So uh, all of this is not just being close to an emergency department, but uh, having, and you said it earlier, consistent, reliable connectivity. And there are places in, in the world, and particularly places in America, where we still don't have that. So as we're looking at having this uh, provide benefit, uh, Microsoft view is we have to work at having it benefit all, not just some. Yeah, that's right. And if we take that and apply it, let's let's go through the care journey here for a moment. And and the start of that journey, the patient presents to the ED, and uh, and then they're triaged. And there's a couple of touch points here where understanding the role of analytics has a, has a significant role. Understanding what's not only really happening with that patient, what their level of risk is, but also that triage includes eligibility. So as you mentioned, uh, and we've both been referring to digital fluency. So. This, this uh, I'll come back to that. I'm going to just touch on the, the other end of this here. So the patient is now at home, and another role for analytics is continuing to manage and monitor uh, for risk and signs of risk and uh, deliver intelligence in a timely manner that is accurate to help to escalate uh, and either prevent a deterioration or get the patient into the, into the hospital environment, which will happen sometimes if a patient is deteriorating. So now I want to come back to the triaging for a moment because what we what we traditionally have in place today, and by traditional, it's you know it's very short life cycle, but much longer in healthcare in general. When we talk about triaging in the ED, it's all almost all clinical and uh, looking at certain clinical parameters. But as we know, the outcomes for patients are driven much, uh, and depending on the setting and the use case, predominantly by socioeconomic drivers of risk, and also the, the, the behavioral aspects of what their choices are, what they'll choose to do or, or be reluctant to participate in. So to see that patient holistically, on the fly, in real time, requires artificial intelligence that takes social determinant data into account. That would help to better, de better provide eligibility criteria. And, and actually, we've been asked in conversations this week with a, with a very large organization uh, to, to help think through eligibility criteria and engageability of patients as we're considering transitioning them into a virtual care approach. And so this is very relevant to see the patient holistically. It's absolutely necessary. And that's a role that artificial intelligence plays uh, in this setting. Absolutely. If we take the, oh, sorry, Tom, go ahead. Yeah. No, I just, you got me excited, John. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Uh, there was a study just released by a great analytical firm, Frost and Sullivan, uh, last month on social determinants of health. The thing that uh, struck me uh, throughout the whole report was uh, their pronouncement that 80% of all medical outcomes are impacted by non-medical uh, events or, or a context. So that's where, to your point, and I know Javion is doing a lot of work with social determinants of health, uh, those are critically important when it comes to managing health, uh, managing for outcomes when someone has a medical condition. Uh, we always talk about data and we talk about continuous monitoring. Um, and, and many times when we have that conversation, everyone's talking and thinking about the clinical data, the data they're generating, and yet our ability to fold in through things like AI in the cloud, all those other data that have great impact on managing an individual's health or a population, critically important. We've got the tools, and a lot of this now is, you know, moving clinical and other leaders towards the, how do we bring that all together and factor those things into the health management process? That's right. So, so digressing here for a moment, this is so important. I'm going to digress on the role of social determinants. And the data itself is extremely important to understand, just to have the data, because we know social determinants drive, and here I've got 60% of health-related outcomes are correlated with social, environmental, and behavioral choices of the patient. The numbers range from 60 and on up. But to say that, well, I have the data, so I know what the risks are, 
if I told a chef that I know the ingredients of a cake so that I can make a cake as well as he could, he would laugh me out of the kitchen, right? So the data is important, but it's irrelevant if I don't understand how those interactions of those different features drive together to create unique risk for the patient sitting in front of me. So I wanna talk a little bit for a moment, just as a digression here, oh, one more slide around this concept of indexes because there are fallacies here that I, I'm on a mission, I'm on a crusade to dispel these fallacies. If I know, and let's just talk about housing stability as a risk factor, and if I say housing stability is the feature and if the short-term residence is bad, long-term residence is good, I'm gonna give you two, two counter examples here. In a patient, let's say with a short-term resident, well, I'll, I'll start with the long-term residents. And you've got a, a, a patient who's older, they've been in the neighborhood for 30 years, recently widowed, all their friends and neighbors moved out, the house is having increasing costs, there's a leak in the roof, there's maybe mold in the back room. That is not a great situation for that person in long-term residence because they are in that long-term residence. So the fact that they've been there a long time doesn't tell me good or bad, it is the other features around that patient, the interactions, such as their marital status, their income, environmental health hazards, et cetera. So you combine those things to say this long-term residence is good or bad. So in that situation, that's not so good for that patient where we might intuitively think long-term residence is good. So then they move. They move closer to their kids, closer to their grandkids. They've got transportation to the doctor's appointments. They've got uh, um, uh, uh, meals uh, provided several days a week. The happiness score goes through the roof because she's seen her grandkids. So now short-term residence, which we would think on that index scale is bad, is actually an incredibly good thing. So having a feature does not tell me that it is good or bad. It is the combination of other socioeconomic features and abil the ability to take that data and interpret it and convert it to intelligence that matters more than anything else. And so if we're going to take and leverage socioeconomic data to make any decisions, even for hospital at home, the interpretation of it is the most important thing to do. All right. Mrs. Lincoln, she's presented to the emergency room and they're triaging her and they've identified uh, some risk factors. We look at the patient holistically and uh, they're ident she's identified as a good candidate to be at, uh, at home. So there will be some things that need to be taken into account though. She's not digitally fluent, or if there are not other adults in the household, then those things need to be taken into account, not just overlooked. So there might be a bit, not the perfect candidate, and yet she's a good candidate, but now we understand the risks around that patient, what has to be taken into account when she goes home. And that's the role, for example, that AI can can play in this patient to better understand and mitigate risks that might be less visible. Absolutely. Now, now if we move the patient uh, into the home setting, on day two of her hospital at home admission, there's an alert generated, she's at risk for deterioration. And the recommendations may include increase the monitoring, intensifying blood sugar control, um, getting nutrition or dietary consult, to uh, educate her some more intensely, some a little bit higher touch. You call this an escalation in a sense. And that would be driven by, again, taking the clinical data and, and understanding and interpreting it, turning it into intelligence once again. So this is a role uh, for, for, again, for the role of artificial intelligence. I'm gonna, I'm gonna digress here to one of the questions. Um, one of the questions was, uh, what, uh, what do we do in terms of behavioral health, mental health for these patients in the post-acute care setting? The opportunity here is for, the, for that tale of that discharge to look differently than when a, ho a hospital discharges a patient and they go home. And, and then oftentimes the support, uh, level of support drops precipitously. And in this case, because they've been in the home, they can see the socioeconomic pressures in person that are, that are affecting that patient's health. Um, there may be uh, an understanding uh, through um, either through interviewing or through AI, some of the pressures that are causing some uh, um, stress, anxiety, depression, um, 
isolation, loneliness with that patient that can be addressed that wouldn't be appreciated if the patient was in the hospital. And secondly, can be, can be uh, uh, used to create a longer tail and a more gradual tapering of support from that acute hospital at home visit. So that was one of the questions that, that came from the audience. I wanted to answer it. Just a, just a, thought, uh, a thought question here, Tom. On the scale of these three bullet points of this is incremental progress or it's innovation or it's transformation, it's tipping industry on its head, how would you, how would you characterize hospital at home and the virtual care trend? Well, I, I, I'd say it can be transformational and eventually it will be. I think um, often is the case in health, um, you know, progress is not as fast as we want. Uh, and some of that's driven by just, you know, the historical ways in which things have been done, uh, the historical ways in which uh, people have been trained. Uh, and then so much of it is driven by the earlier conversation around uh, things like reimbursement models. And, and uh, it's those things in combination that to me determine the speed of change. Um, we know, back to the earlier parts of the conversation, We've got this auto bond for, for data that's secure and compliant called the cloud. We've got AI that um, literally with every passing quarter becomes better, stronger, and, and the ability to componentize those things, put them in the hands of uh, smart uh, clinical leaders and others who really seek to change and make things better, whether it's better for their patients, or trying to address the horrible problem we have with clinician burnout. So I, I know people have fire in their belly for doing this. I, I know there are lots of people who have ideas on how to use it, and you don't have to be an expert at artificial intelligence. Instead, you're that frontline clinician saying, if only there was a better way to do this. So uh, I think a lot of the people are ready and willing. I think the speed is going to be driven by, um, you know, the, the, what I call the leadership imperative for those running big payer provider organizations, uh, leadership imperative when it comes to the regulators and legislators to be able to kind of get out of their own way and start providing reimbursement models that allow providers and payers to do much better at using the technology. I think we're here at the discussion uh, section, again, being respectful of our time. We've got about five minutes left in the webinar today, and we've had a couple of questions that I've responded to. Um, there's another question from the audience, and, and please uh, add any questions that you have. Um, one of the questions was, what are the principles for data sharing in this model? And some guiding principles, and I'll, I'll throw one or I'll throw a couple out there, uh, especially that are relevant in, in, in the last 18 months. We've had a lot of uh, uh, data breaches. So cybersecurity is going to be uh, very, very important, uh, and and protecting that chain of custody of data as it's moving around. Um, I would say another principle would be provenance of the data. By provenance, tracking where it came from, protecting the integrity and, and identity of what that data is, what it means, uh, the metadata around it, characterizing it will be very important. So um, those that would be another principle as well as, and I know Microsoft has a, has a strong position on this, but the concept of ownership of the data and the customers own the data. Uh, so Tom, please expound on that or any other thoughts around principles for data sharing in this model. Well, I and mean, we could take a whole hour just on that, John, but it, you know, in, uh, in a nutshell, Microsoft, we're very clear on our, our view of data, which is, you know, that's the, that's the consumer's purview, that's their asset. Uh, everything we do uh, really is in respect of honoring um, that view of data and the consumer and all that data about you or your patients. You know, beyond that, um, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the, the barriers that we discussed earlier. An, another key barrier is uh, things like hospital at home and all of this data that, that is needed on sensing, on monitoring, on predicting uh, that, that is used by clinicians and anyone else, that will only happen if consumers feel that the systems that their data is going into are trustworthy. And right. uh, yes, there are, there are plenty of examples of data breaches, of uh, people doing nefarious things. 
but at some level has always been that. And, and I don't mean to minimize it, but you know, years ago when I was a hospital executive, uh, how do we spend uh, most of our time pushing data to physicians from the hospital? Fax machines. And I, I'm not suggesting that uh, that is a, a, a standard, but it's just to say, uh, are there some risks associated with what we're doing on data? Yes. Uh, properly provisioned, uh, and, and whether it's following protocols such as HIPAA or in Europe GDPR, or whether it's all those other things we're capable of, the, the benefits of doing this with all of those security guardrails in place, uh, I, I think are far greater than either the risks that we may be facing, or frankly, the, the risk of just continuing to do things the way we're doing them today. Uh, there was another question from the audience, and I got a question for you too, Tom. And we can close with this, unless there's one. One, we'll take one last question. Um, question to you first: What's the next five years look like? And uh, and this is for the audience. We it would be happy for you to uh, check one of these off. We won't share the um, won't share the results here. But if you if you want to uh, respond to this quick poll, um, it'll allow us to know how we can better serve you. And while you're answering that, um, Tom, what's a, well, I I, I, uh, I don't know if I'm still on camera. I'm moving around in my chair. I'm oh, I'm so excited about uh, technically what's happening and what will happen in the next five years. So uh, it's only going to get better when it comes to the the capabilities of AI going up, the ease of use of of anyone being able to take those things and start creating solutions around the problems they want to solve for. Uh, I'll do a special call out. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was uh, privileged to be part of something called uh, Nurse Hack for Health, sponsored by Microsoft and J&J &J and some of the great nurse executives at Microsoft. But for two days, nurses from around the world were ideating different ways of innovating healthcare using things like uh, the cloud, data, and AI. And some of the ideas uh, were just amazing. So the technology is only going to get better. The speed of change is really going to be driven by those people on the front lines of providing care, running these organizations uh, who have big problems to solve and, and stepping up to say, with these technologies, I can, in fact, do things differently. Uh, Tom, thank you very much for your expertise and participating in the webinar today. And thanks for all of our participants. My pleasure, John. Uh, seriously, JVN is doing great work. I love some of the work you've been doing with uh, social determinants long before others stepped into the game, including a lot of the great work you've done with COVID. So we're, we're very excited about the work you're doing and thank you for, uh, for having me.